good morning, Relevant Church. How are we doing this morning? Let's go, let's go. So good to see y'all. Um, if I haven't had a pleasure to meet you, my name is David Narvaez. I used to be the youth pastor here. And then, um, you know, Pastor Paul kicked me on the curb one day, so you gotta fend for yourself. I'm just playing. Um, this is actually my sending church. I do missions now. Um, and actually, the next service, um, Pastor Paul is uh, me the honor. Uh, he's gonna be ordaining me along with other church elders here. So um, it's, it's a special day. Um, special day. And because it is a small group, uh, I'm excited for the small groups out there. But because I have the stage, Pastor Paul gave me permission, I can shout out mine, okay? So you're gonna see one out there called The Blueprint. Just to give you a little backstory, for the past year and a half, God had burdened my heart for a discipleship program that I believe will impact the local church here in the States and also across the world. And so for the past year and a half, I developing that. And uh, I got the book cover, everything's ready to go. And this is going to be the first iteration of that class. And those that it's going to be 16 weeks this Wednesday, starting at 6.30 PM. It's going to be about two hours. There's childcare. If you have a teenager, youth group is that night. Um, and that's a way for you to build your foundation on Christ. Answer some of those questions like, what is the story of scripture? How do we study the Bible? What is my specific gifting and calling that God has for my life? And for those that go through it with me, this first iteration, I'll be giving you the very first copy of the books when they're printed. So just a little shout out for that in case you were interested, but I'm excited for today. So uh, Pastor Paul, I think this is such a perfect sermon series called Made for More. And I want to start with this. So I was doing a little bit of research and according to Lifeway Research, four out of five Americans believe, just Americans, believe there is an ultimate purpose and plan for, for each person's life. More than 68% say a major priority in their life is finding their deeper purpose. And what's interesting that among Christians, the more often they attend church, the more likely they are to say that they have found their purpose. So those that go to church once a month, only 51% say, I believe I found my purpose. But those that attend four or more times a month, 76% of them believe in their heart and soul that they have found purpose, which is, I think is interesting that the more you attend church, the more likely you are to believe you have found what true purpose is. And I wanna ask you the question this morning, do you believe you have found it? That, that's a question that all of us think about, we all, we all dwell on, we all have an idea of what it should be. Do you believe you have found purpose for your life. And the reason I want to share some of the statistics is because 81% of Americans believe that there is an ultimate purpose, which means 81% believe that we are made for more. We're not made, God didn't create us to just live, eat, die, sleep, and that's it. Like, like, or probably sleeping before dying, but you, you kind of get my point there, right? Like that's not what we were created for. We weren't just to wake up this morning, got to brush my teeth, commute to work, because you know, the I-4 traffic, can I, I mean, come on somebody, there's, there's some demonic activity on the I-4, can I get an amen? Like, like that's not what we were made for. And so even re regardless of the church, that four out of five people in the America believe that we are made for more. And, and the, the, the belief drives us to research, drives us to question, drives us to ask, drives us to discover what is our calling, what is our purpose, and how do I become what I was created to be? One of my favorite stories and someone who's had an impact on my life is Dr. William Lane Craig. If you don't know who he is, um, he is a famous Christian apologist, Christopher Hitchens, all the famous atheists you can think of, he's debated them. Atheists have said he's the only Christian apologist that can put the fear of God in an atheist. So if that's kind of your reputation as a Christian apologist, I think you're doing a good job. But his story, it's impacted me so much. He, he didn't grow up in a religious home and um, it was in his teenage years, obviously a very smart guy, he started thinking about these things. He started thinking about the questions of what is my purpose? What is meaning? Why, why am I created? Why am I here on this earth? And, and it kind of brought him to an existential crisis. And so not knowing what to do, he decided to attend this local church. And what he was frustrated at is there was these people claiming they had truth, claiming they had purpose, but yet he said they live for their real God after Sunday on Monday for popularity. And so he was frustrated, he became bitter because he saw an incongruency. And so as time went on, he began to question, he began to isolate, he began to become more frustrated. And until one day, he, I love this story, he showed up to class and there was uh, this girl named Sandy that was sitting in front of him in a high school class. And he describes it like this, she was one of those annoying happy people. You know what I mean? Like those people you're in the office and like you smile too much. 
Like I haven't even had my coffee yet. And like, you're like, oh my gosh, like praise be the Lord. Like, no, it's, I haven't even woken up yet. And you're, you're way too excited. And he said, she was so, one of those people that it made him sick. He's like, I can't stand it. So in that class, he, he tapped her on her shoulder and he goes, you know what, Sandy? Why are you so happy all the time? Why are you so joyous? It, it's, it's really annoying. And she goes, well, uh, G- uh, Bill, uh, uh, Jesus saved me. He goes, wait, he's like, what do you mean he saved you? Well, well Jesus lives in my heart. And, and, and if you accept him, he can live in your heart too. And he goes, why would he wanna do a thing like that? That doesn't even make any sense. And over the course of time, when, when, when he heard that statement, he felt this rush of love. The fact that this, this creator of the universe did not only create him for purpose, but loved him. And so for the next six months of his life, he began studying and studying, reading the New Testament over and over and over again. And and it became to the end of it where he realized, I have to make a decision. And so as he was reading the New Testament, he, he, he saw an authenticity. He saw a truth about this person of Jesus. And he said, if this really is true, then I can do nothing less than spend the rest of my life sharing this message among the world. And, and after that, that crisis, he went outside. He said, describes it as a warm, uh, warm summer, uh, sunny night, and the stars were out. And he just allowed himself to receive the love of God in that moment. And, and Jesus saved him that day. And that was at, as a teenager. And since then, he has impacted the world around us because of some person named Sandy who had the joy of the Lord in her. And at the end of the day, that's what essentially all of us want. Like we all want to be infused with a purpose beyond ourselves that isn't dictated by circumstances. And, and I believe that truth can be true for you. And th- there's this passage in Hebrews I wanna go through. And I believe if there's, there's six things, if you would recognize God can be able to speak his truth into your life. And we're gonna be in Hebrews 12. If you do have your Bibles, Hebrews 12, verses one through three. It says this, therefore, Since we have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance in the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself so that you won't grow weary and give up. And so when, when, we, when we read that word, therefore, I want you to ask the question, what is it therefore, okay? So when you read therefore, that means there's, there's, there's a previous thought that the author is bringing us through. So, so what is it therefore? So to get a little bit of a context, you have to go to Hebrews 10, verse 39. It says this, but we are not those who draw back and are destroyed, but those who are, have faith and are saved. So there, there's two types of people that scripture is describing, those who draw back and those who are destroyed, those who have faith and those who, that are saved. And so we, we have, we survey, if we survey the people around us, we can, we can all think of someone, anyway, and it might've even been yourself that, that used to go to church, that used to be a Christian, that used to have faith. And, and, and that might've been us at one time, we stopped gathering with the believers. We stopped praying. We stopped associating with Jesus. Our faith began to die until you were reminded of this. If you're in this room, Hebrews 11.1, 1, the first part, it says, now faith is the reality of what is hoped for. Faith is the reality or the assurance or some translations say firm foundation. Our faith is grounded in a hope that we will see those loved ones that have passed away that have trusted Christ. Like that's a hope that we hold on to. There are people in this room that have lost family members and loved ones and that hope continues to drive us forward. We, we believe that we will be healed. My, my, my father is with us and he likes to call it a, a diagnosis. But two and a half years ago, he was diagnosed with stage four cancer. And he still is there worshiping and praising God. Why? Because he has hope. Because his faith is grounded in hope. We have hope that God will deliver me from my circumstance, even though I have fallen short so many times of God's perfect standard, that Jesus will save me despite my shortcomings. That my life, I have a hope that my life does have purpose. 
I have, a, I have a hope that my life does have purpose, that God really did choose me. God really did choose you for such a time as this. And it's easy to say, well, he could have chosen anyone else. Yeah, but it's you. And what, what are you gonna do with, with, with that? Faith is grounded in hope. And then it says this, the second part of the verse. For the proof of what is not seen, the proof, the conviction, the evidence of what we don't see, that the faith that we hold is evidence of the unseen, the belief that you have is evidence of God's supernatural work. And that faith will lead you down a road because you are made for more. You are made for more. And then in verse two, it says this, for by this, our ancestors or our forefathers were approved. So, so, so the guiding light for those that we have known, the guiding light for those in the past of unwavering faith was this. And we have the entire chapter 11 story. It's almost a storybook of going from Genesis through the scriptures. It's the proof of what is not seen. We see in, in Genesis chapter four that Abel's faith led to God approving his sacrifice. In Genesis chapter five, Enoch's faith allowed him to not experience death. In Genesis chapter six, Noah's faith empowered him to build an ark when everyone was like, by the way, they say it took 75 years for him to build it. After year one, I'm like, dude, what are you doing, man? Like after year 10, I'm like, bro, it hasn't rained in like eight years and you're still, you're still building that ark. Like, what are you doing? But faith empowered him to do that. He goes on in, in chapter 11 about Sarah and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and, and many others. And in the midst of all that, the author expresses the suffering each experience through mockings, through scourgings, through imprisonment, sawed in two, died by the sword and wandered the earth in the state of affliction. That's not exactly a Disney movie ending if I've, if I've heard one. And I could keep on going through the examples it gives in, in, in chapter 11, but they all lead to this one verse right before our text for today. In Hebrews eleven thirty nine 39 through 40. It says, all these were approved through their faith, but they did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better for us so that they would not be made perfect without us. So every single person before AD 33 was waiting for the ultimate promise, was waiting for the ultimate promise, which you and I are able to know and experience today. So when they were going through their go-through and they were experiencing what they were experiencing, they were looking for, towards a hope that we are able to experience today. So how, how do we walk in that same assurance? How do we walk with that same faith, that same purpose that the men and women of our past have lived in the midst of persecution and judgment? And, and I'll say this, when, when we hear those stories or read the Bible, I'll say this. It's so easy to say, well, that's just for them. Right? I mean, that's just for them. You, you see people that have the joy of the Lord. You see people that walk in purpose and you think, well, I mean, come on, I, I can never do that, right? Th these people are special. They are unique. There's no way I could do that. But each of us know one thing, that if we were created by God, then we are created for a purpose. Then we are made for something more. We are made for something more. And even though you might struggle to believe that today, and in, in, in my life, I have struggled to believe that, I wanna remind you that God doesn't make mistakes. God doesn't make mistakes. God is in control. God has made you for a purpose, a purpose as such a time as this. So how do we walk in God's purpose for our lives? Let's, let's start in verse one. Therefore, since we all have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us. And what's interesting is that word witness, it's not witnessing, it's not a verb, it's a noun. So a witness is not something you do, although we do witness to people. In this specific passage, it's someone you are. And so the witnesses in, in chapter 11 are people that God has witnessed walking in faith and the people witness God working in miraculous ways. So it's both and, it's God saying, well done my good and faithful servant. I know what you've gone through and you still continued on. And in the midst of that, from our perspective, it's witnessing how God has delivered us when we lost all hope. And so here's my first point. You, you must run with the family. You must run with the family. The scripture is saying we have testimonies, 
We have stories. We have examples of people around us who believed and saw God's work in their life. And because of that belief, they continue on. It's possible to live the life God had in store before you were even born. I know sometimes we lack that belief. We lack that faith. We think, well, like I said, it's, it's for them. It's not for me. But if you run with a family, you are encouraged. In Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 10, it says this, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their efforts. For if either falls, his com companion can lift him up, but pity the one who falls without another to lift him up. And I wanna say this, running without a family is like driving a car without, a, without ever seeing a mechanic. Like, okay, technically you don't need one. And for some of you that are mechanically inclined, I'm like, I definitely don't need one. But for the average person, um, you'll, you'll one day, you'll hit an issue with your car that you can't do it on your own. You'll have an issue with your car that you, you can't understand the problem. No matter how many YouTube videos you watch, I am a firm believer. The reason these YouTube videos have so many views is because it's me going back from like minute three to minute one. I'm like, dude, I've watched the same thing 20 times. I don't know how you get from this step to the next, next step. I don't know. Um, but like, that's kind of what happens. And, and so what a church family is, it's that support. It's that encouragement. It's the people that can lift you up when you fall into the ground. And that's why I love this Sunday because you have an opportunity to step into a community of people that can encourage you, empower you, even when you feel down on yourself. And, but I wanna say this, we can't run in God's purpose without running with God's people. We can't run in God's purpose without running with God's people. I remember when I first started my uh, uh, Bible college, I, I took this cl class called Mentoring and Coaching. And the one book that I read, I, I'll never forget the statistic, it said this, the people that have had the, the biggest uh, impact regarding the kingdom of God, regarding the church, regarding our faith, are those that, uh, the only similarity between those people was that they could point to three to five people, three to five mentors, three to five men or women that have guided them and discipled them. And so early in my life, I was like, or early in my ministry, I was like, well, if that's true, if that's the only common denominator, well, I'm gonna find myself a mentor. And I remember, um, actually uh, next service, Dr. Doug Lay will be here, but I remember meeting uh, Dr. Doug and, and Paula at, at a different church I was serving at. And he was teaching a class and I saw a vigor I saw a passion for the word of God. I saw a, the Holy Spirit working through him. And then when he took me under his wing and started discipling me, I saw the way he loved his wife. I saw the way his wife loved him. I, I saw things in them, which inspired me to want to be more. It inspired me. And what I realized is this, if you want to walk in purpose, you have to find people around you that can encourage you. We're not supposed to do this on our own. Second part of verse one says this, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. And this is my second point, we must resist temptation. And the author gives us two examples. The Greek word for hindrance is actually weight. It's the only time it's used in the New Testament. It's actually a weightiness and sin is breaking God's law. And so what I wanna say is sin in our life causes damage to those around us, causes damage to ourself, causes damage between our relationship with God. And that's why Galatians 6, 7 says, don't be, don't, don't be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a person sows, he will also reap because the one who sows to his flesh will reap destruction from the flesh. But the one who sows to the spirit will reap eternal life from the spirit. If we continue to sow into sin, to sow into death, we can't expect to reap a harvest of life. You can't continue to invest in a declining stock and hope that you're gonna make money. At some point, you have to recognize it's not bearing fruit. And no matter how much the enemy tries to trick you and confuse you to believe, you really need this. I promise you, God's ways are better. God's path is better. It's so much better than whatever your mind, your heart, the enemy can confuse you to wanna walk in. And what is a hindrance? And I think hindrances are interesting. Um, they're usually subtle and they start small 
and build over time. And what kind of happens is what started as maybe scrolling on your phone in the morning, listen, we're all guilty of that. There'll be like three weeks. I'm like, what is going on with my life, right? You just start scrolling and scrolling. You get a habit of doing it. But what starts as scrolling can, can lead to laziness. What started as a late night, late night snack, and Lord knows I've had plenty of those, led to gluttony. What started as cheating on our taxes leads to greed. What started as an unwillingness to reconcile leads to a hardened heart. And so what happens is we start building up these little hindrances, these little weights in our lives, and it starts to weigh us down. Little weights grow into burdens and burdens lead to sins. That's what we see a pattern of. And I wanna say this, weights hinder our race, but sin hurts our race. A hindrance, when you're, when you're running this race God has called you to, it might slow you down, but sin might take you out of the race. There's so many countless examples I can give you of people, and I know you've seen them online, where they have a big ministry, a big platform, a big whatever, and, and, and all of a sudden they fall, this little secret sin that they have or this little secret hindrance grows into something more, and then they ruin their entire life that they built in ministry because of a hindrance they weren't willing to let go. And if we can be honest with ourselves, if we can be honest with God and a willingness to let go, a heart of confession, we can live a life made for more. And then it continues on in verse 12 or verse one. It says, let us run with endurance. Let us run with endurance. My third point, you must race with endurance. I, I, my brother-in-law, uh, he's a was in the Navy SEALs for about 14 years. And what's interesting about SEAL training is uh, they start with usually about 150. And by the end of the six months, there's usually between 10 and 20 left. So the attrition rate is about 90%. And I've always, I was always curious, like, well, like what makes... Like, what makes the difference? Like, is it star athletes? And what's interesting is, of course, the people that weren't prepared, they ended up failing first off. But the second group of people were actually star athletes, the ones that could run, the ones that could swim, the one that, that ones that could do all the push-ups and sit-ups. And I was like, why is, that, why, why is that the case? And what he said to me is because they've never failed. They, they've been star athletes their whole life. They've outshined everyone and they've never hit a point in their life where they said they couldn't do it. They've had this, this unshakable faith and endurance that no matter what this race is gonna be, I'm gonna be able to succeed. And so when they get to SEAL training, the, the goal it, from, from his perspective as an instructor wasn't to make you feel how good you are. It was to break you down until you feel like you could not go any further. And I feel like, isn't that such an interesting picture of what it means to have faith? And the, the interesting thing about six months of SEAL training, listen, someone can do it for a day, someone can do it for a week, someone can maybe do it for a month, but when you're doing it for six months, wet, cold, sandy, hurt, broken, what will you do then? And, and so what, what we see is a pattern of is those that have true resolve, they end up enduring. Those who have true faith, they end up enduring. Last part of verse one. It says the race that lies before us, the race that lies before us, fourth point, you must remember your race. And here's the thing, we all have two races to run, right? We have the race that we have corporately, that is together as the body of Christ, and then we have an individual race. So we, as the body of Christ, are here to know him, to love him, to become like him, to make Jesus famous in the world, sharing the light of the gospel to those around us shrouded in darkness. As the corporate body, we are supposed to be a light, a city set on a hill. But then we have our own lives. You have your own careers, you have your own families, you have the weird in-laws. Listen, they're there. They're secret, but we know you're there. And you're like, I didn't know we had them. I'm like, well, it might be you. I'm just saying, you know, you never know. The one that point everyone else. Um, but like, we all have our situations and our circumstances. And what we tend to do, and we all do this, especially with social media, we tend to compare ourselves to everyone else around us. And according to Pew Research Center, 64% of US adults believe social media has negatively affected our country. I feel like that should be higher, but that's a lot. And I would argue the main reason is because we compare ourselves to others. Social media keeps us constantly informed about what is going on in other people's lives. And so no wonder we're constantly drawn and seeing what other lives people are living. All of a sudden they have the nicer car. 
All of a sudden they have the nicer house. All of a sudden you're like, man, them, their kids behave. What's wrong with my kids? Do you need an exorcism or something? Y'all need to relax. Like, like we, we start looking at the outside and saying, well, well they, they are blessed. God is blessing them. And then you ask, why not me? Why not me? I remember when I, I first started, getting, uh, started in ministry and um, my wife and I were living in a uh, 1999 uh, Winnebago 31 Brave. It didn't have any slides. It's an RV. This thing had, ma- I didn't, first time buying an RV, massive amounts of water damage, worst purchase of our life. Um, and I remember like, living where I was. And I was thinking back as to where I was previously. When I wasn't following the Lord, I was living in San Diego, had a nice apartment. I had two motorcycles and a car. But what was interesting is me reflecting on my own race. I realized I had more peace. I had more joy. I had more fulfillment in a water damaged, nasty, ugly 1999 Winnebago 31 Brave than I did when I had the cars, the motorcycles and the life in San Diego. When you walk in God's purpose, walk in God's peace, I promise you, it's something you can't experience anywhere else. And that's where you're in, in Psalm 119, 165, it says abundant peace belongs to those who love your instruction, who love your law, nothing makes them stumble. And so as much as I believe comparison is the thief of joy, it's also the thief of your journey. You need to be focused on the race that God has in front of you. And peace can only come through running your race, not comparing yourselves to others, but what gave the witnesses the hope? What, what, gave, what allows us to be in the family of God? What allows us to resist temptation? What gives us strength to endure? What gives us purpose in life to run the race? That's in verse two. Keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy laid before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse, or this is my fifth point here. We must rest our eyes on Jesus. We don't live our lives based on the results of our actions, but based on the object of our faith. Jesus is the one who began your faith and he's the one who completes it. Jesus is the author of your faith and the one who finishes it. Jesus is the pioneer and the perfecter. Jesus is the alpha and the omega. Jesus is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Jesus is the one who started it. And I promise you, he's the one to complete it. And that's why I love Philippians 1, 6. I am sure, I am confident in this, that he, who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. I can say that with confidence because I know Jesus and I know if he started something in your life, man, he's gonna finish it. I promise you that today. And and, and he endured the cross, endured the shame for for what joy, For, for what purpose? So that one day he could resurrect your soul to life. One day he could bring purpose to your life. One day he could bring a hope in you that he will finish what he started. Do you believe that today? Do do you believe that Jesus, if he started it, that he's gonna finish it in your life? And I I believe God wants to speak to someone. And the reason that you've lost hope is your eyes have been focused on other things. Your eye, and I get it, th- those things, I know people in this church that have lost houses on, on, because of the last storm. So man, I, I mean, I, and, and yet they still post on Facebook, praise glory to God. Like that's the kind of faith. And, and I feel like the reason we get so, we lose so much hope and we get frustrated is because we're fixing our eyes on the things and the Holy Spirit is trying to draw us back to fix our eyes on Jesus. When you shift your focus, you restore your faith. When you shift your focus, you restore your faith. And as I begin to to close this message, I wanna tell you a story of a boy. This is a true story. He lost all hope. He did not believe he was made for more. His his parents split up when he was five, lived with with a stepfather who was a retired drill instructor. And for 10 years of his life, experienced abuse. Um, physically and uh, uh, verbally. Uh, He was not able to shower. Uh, He was uh, not allowed to have heat during cold winter months. He was uh, not able to uh, uh, eat as a punishment. 
He was uh, locked in his room for hours upon end, but even beyond all that, it, it was the words. It was every day being screamed at, cursed at, yelled at, and reminded that he would never amount to anything. Reminded that he was never made for more. And it created a cycle of hatred and anger towards God, anger towards his family, and angry at the situation in his own life. And it brought him to a point where he did not want to live anymore. By God's grace, that boy moved when he was 15 years old, started going back to church, and, and, and God slowly began to restore his heart. And, and he saved him and brought him to a moment where he got baptized at 18. And in that moment, when, when he went under the water and he came out, he felt this experiential power of the Holy Spirit, this electricity in his soul. And for the first time in his life, he believed God's truth in his heart and mind. For the first time in the midst of brokenness, in the midst of experiencing trauma, he believed God's truth, that there is hope, that he was loved, that there is purpose, that he was made for more. And I don't know if you can relate I don't know if you had a childhood like that. I don't even know if, if you believe those things about yourself and they linger in your heart and they linger in your mind to condemn you. But I wanna speak some hope into your heart because that, that little scared, angry boy was me. And I am able to stand here and, and deliver a message from his word purely by the grace of God and say to you, it's not over. There is hope. Don't give up. You do have purpose. And although I had to experience that, I began to learn what God's word was teaching. And it was these, these six things. Number one, run with a family. We, we must run with other people. We can't do this alone. Number two, resist all hindrances. We have to let go of the weights and the sins in our life. Number three, race with endurance. You have to keep going. Y yes, it's gonna be difficult, but I promise you God will see it through. Four, remember your race. Don't get so caught up in the life. Rest your eyes on Jesus, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And here's my last point, And this is verse three. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself so that you won't grow weary and give up. Give up. Here's my last point. Jesus did not quit so you wouldn't. Jesus did not give up so that you wouldn't. Jesus embraced suffering. He endured shame, was spat on, ridiculed, beaten, and crucified on the cross for you while you were an enemy of God, while you hated God. And if you just come to him and acknowledge your sin and repent, the Holy Spirit can give you a new life and believe that he died for your sins, that he rose again on the third day. Jesus can save you. He can redeem you. He can reconcile you to God. He can clean you up. You don't have to get into the shower before you get clean. You go in the shower to get clean. And when you just acknowledge that he is there waiting for you to come to his feet, he can infuse you with purpose today, like he did me and like he did those around us in this church. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we love you. We worship you. We thank you, Lord, for the redemptive work in our lives. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for your presence. But God, I, I just want to give an opportunity for someone that has not accepted you as Lord and Savior. This day, you can give them purpose. You can give them life. You can save them from their mistakes, save them from their sins. And with every eye closed, every head bowed, I want to pray for someone. Yeah, I already see a hand up. Praise God. Is there anyone else I can pray for? You'd like to accept Lord and Savior, Jesus. Praise God. Lord, thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit working. God, it is not a prayer that saves us. It's you, Jesus. If we trust in you as Lord and Savior, you can redeem us. And I want to pray for one more group because I think it's so important. Listen, I know this race is difficult. I know it's hard. I know y'all have experienced some things I can't even imagine. But I want to pray though for the Holy Spirit to fill you. So if you're in a season of life where you just need some empowerment, you just need some encouragement, would you lift your hand? I want to pray for you. Yes, I see hands here. Please, yes. I see hands. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I pray for those that just need a wind of your Holy Spirit. God, we can't do this on our own. God, I ask that you would fill them with your empowerment, God. Would you draw them back to your feet? Would you empower them?
them and encourage them to fix their eyes on you. And when they see you with their issues or their situations begin to melt away. God, we know that you love them. We know that you love us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.